Yes, a todos, welcome um, all to this uh, third day of conference. We have with us today uh, Peter Antoniani, Senior Teaching Fellow of UCL School of Management. We are very happy to have him here. Um, Peter Antoniani has, is an um, economist. He has written um, all kind of books and articles about different topics in economics, um, from very specialist one to other more uh, popular, so to say, so that's as microeconomics for dummies, yeah. microeconomics for dummies, and he has worked on football transfers, actually, yes. the market of football transfers, so a very interesting topic as well. But today, he's going to speak about the homicide rate in King's Landing, Oh my God, that's high. And other questions you never thought of asking, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, uh, title of the presentation is What's the Homicide Rate in King's Landing? Um, it's actually really uh, talking about how we use uh, Game of Thrones and media properties in general in teaching economics. And in particular, we have a course that's on the economics of technology that requires uh, our students to take a longer view of technological development along the way, whilst picking up a lot of Schumpeterian theory in economics. Um, it's challenging, and um, it was uh, often, um, before, before me and my team took it over, it was often regarded as a bit of a chore that final year students had to go through. Um, and one of the things that we did was uh, introduce using um, more media properties uh, as a way in to some of the thornier questions. And there are two that we found have been brilliant for it. One is uh, The Wire, which was uh, HBO's previous prestige offering before the Game of Thrones. And the other, of course, is the Game of Thrones. So. Um, this is my reaction, by the way, to the final episode. Um, this is the chalkboard gag from Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 2 from The Simpsons. So, um, now, I'm not a medievalist, and I know I'm in a, a company of a lot of uh, medievalists at this conference. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be on your patch, but um, this apparently is the oldest uh, secular song known in England. It's called Myriad Is. And um, as you can see, it's written in perfectly comprehensible English. Um, if I read this out, it's Myriatis while summer last with foolish son, Ochnu necheth windis blast and wed a strong. Ay, ay, what this nicht is long, and ich with well Michel wrong, sorin mourn and fast. Okay, and translation winter is coming. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, I have three uh, interwoven strands. One is about the ways that we use Game of Thrones, both book and series. Uh, one is some of, the thing of, some of the principles that we found work if you're reaching into students using media properties. And a little sideways glance at the economics of media properties in general, which is a very fascinating and very, very relevant subject at the moment. Um, and along the way, well, there are some almost unbelievable, um, well, I'd say quite challenging truths about our economic development in the long run. And I'm hoping to drop a couple of these ones in. Um, they might be an absolute curveball along the way. So let's return to the title. What's the homicide rate in King's Landing? Come on, class. This is going to be on the final exam. Well, I'm very glad you asked. Um, as anybody who knows, uh, and we had this yesterday with the uh, idea of the wall being 800 foot tall, which I think is about the height of the tallest building in London. Um, George Martin is not, shall we say, the most quantitative of authors. You know, uh, how many got killed? Oh, half a hundred, uncle. I don't know. Um, that's not a problem to an economist. You know, uh, we, we often have to try and figure out how much things are or how much things are worth using very little data to go on, often because the thing that we're trying to price to market does not quite exist yet. So if any of you, for example, watched the Uber um, IPO um, and saw 
what happened there. What happened was that people had a guess at how much they thought it was worth, and then the actions of participants in the market tried to put some flesh onto that through a process that we call price discovery. Now, here's the interesting thing. How do you make that first initial guess to price something? Well, one of the things we do is a method called using comparables. We look for something that's a little bit like that thing, and then we say, well, yes, if we know this much about something A, we can maybe infer or deduce something about B. So um, if, I, if I've got that knowledge, I can create a comparable, and I can do, and if I'm really sophisticated about it, and I have a really great data series, I can actually start putting some statistical flesh on that. I can talk about correlations or covariances or variances with market risk and many other uh, obscure ways of doing this, some, some very good, some poor. Well, funnily enough, my compar I have a good comparable. Now, one of the things I think uh, Game of Thrones gets wrong about the Middle Ages is the amount of information that was available. Um, Britain is a nation of record keepers. Um, assiduous record keeping goes back even before the Doomsday Book. The Anglo-Saxon kings were very good at it. And uh, in a paper, Manuel Eisner, uh, a sociologist, used figures obtained from records kept by a court that operated in London called the Erie. And going back through these uh, records for 13th and 14th century London, and funnily enough, we actually know more about the homicides than we know about the overall population, which is a really interesting point. Um, it, he deduced an estimate for a standardized homicide rate of about 20 per 100,000. A wiki of ice and fire tells me that the population of King's Landing is about 500,000. So that means there ought to be about 100 homicides a year in King's Landing. So it's a lot more violent than, uh, than medieval London was, I think, in, uh, you know, if we're, if we're watching the show at least, the amount of murder and mayhem is very much higher than medieval London. By the way, you'll be very, very unsurprised to know that, uh, you know, this is Britain, and the vast majority of these uh, homicides were the result of drunken brawls. We're good at it. We stick to what we know. Um, comparison. There were 137 homicides in London for a population of nearly, eight, well, nearly 9 million. So a standardized homicide rate, which is, very, which is actually very low, of 1.56 per 100,000. New York's is about two and a half times that. Um, but it's not the most violent. King's Landing is not the most violent city in a TV franchise. The homicide rate in Baltimore we can get from the FBI database, and it gives us uh, standardized homicide rates per city. Baltimore comes out third in the US behind Detroit and New Orleans. And the homicide rate in early 21st century Baltimore is uh, an average of about 50 per 100,000. So that's two and a half times more lethal than um, uh, medieval London. And that is a challenging fact, isn't it? The Mid Middle Ages were not all that violent. <laughs> OK, uh, here's the moral to the story. So these are the lessons that we really want to drive home here, because at this point, people have just kind of gone and then started laughing. So, well, ultimately, markets work on people's estimates. As William Goldman said about Hollywood, no one knows anything. But we spend a lot of time trying to figure out good guesses. Um, participants don't really know a lot about what they're pricing or producing when things first come to market. So price discovery is important. If you can think up a comparable for something you don't actually know, explore it. You might not be right, but in this case it's more important not to be stupid than it is to be right. So this is a reasonably credible methodology for estimation. And finally, don't ever say there's no data. Be creative. Data exists in all types of uh, shapes and forms. Just because you can't download it all onto a spreadsheet, it doesn't mean it's not data. 
So, um, you know, you'll find something. And if not, well, there's still Fermi estimation, which, uh, you know, since the Drake equation, the famous Drake equation, uses Fermi estimation to come up with a number of um, civilizations existing in the galaxy, you know, you can use Fermi estimation for a lot of things, and it's a fairly robust method. So, how do we use uh, Game of Thrones more, more specifically? Okay, there's two issues I want to quickly broach and drop before the end of the, before the, I go on to that. The first one is, sensitively, you may have to give content warnings, okay? Um, and in fact, you'll see one a little bit later for, before I play the wire. I'm not required to do that. It's considered polite in Britain. Uh, it may be different wherever you are. Um, and secondly, are you going to put it on the reading list? Now, this is actually a much bigger problem than you think, because uh, I have to account for a standard 150 hours of student effort. And if I put a show like Game of Thrones on the reading list, the first thing a student says to me is, are you really expecting me to watch 73 min hours of sword fighting rather than getting on with learning microeconomics? So um, we recommend it as adjunct, usually. And we will refer to particular effort, episodes or scenes. OK, so there were two key strands. Uh, medieval stasis, the theory of economic development. Um, and in particular, in our course, this is also a, th a theory about technological development. Um, and secondly, strategy, theory, and behavior. Now, my advice, again, is be quite clear about how whatever you're doing relates. Again, we find that students are very much, yeah, but I don't see the point of this. So when I get that, I, I know that me and my team have not quite communicated that effectively enough. So dealing a little bit with technology, which I think is one of the interesting stories, um, and especially in the context of, well, you know, we, we tend to have this belief that there were the bad old days and we were, we're advancing, you know, rapidly into some shiny, sunny uplands of the future. And that, you know, people in the past were uh, not exactly stupid, but they weren't as smart as us, you know, um, which is why they were peasants and they ate mud and all the rest of it. And this is, this is actually a very, you know, a very common belief. And... I say, you know, it's worth challenging some of these beliefs. It's certainly worth challenging the really strange inevitability at one. Um, so suppose I were to tell you that a, a group of war-torn, weather-strewed, beaten islands in the uh, far arse end of the uh, North Atlantic archipelago were to build an empire that would conquer the world, you'd go, no, come on, somebody with much more advantageous conditions or resources is going to do it. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a myth that grows up, and it's something that's re because, really because history tends to be written by the winners. And this is also the case with technology. It's not inevitable, for example, that uh, the keyboards we've all got are QWERTY. QWERTY keyboards were invented, in fact, in the 19th century to slow typists down because they were too fast for the old key typewriters. And there were other forms, and QWERTY was just the one that won out in some way. Um, we can't really prove it was a lot better than anything else, but it's the one that won, and it's the one that we think, well, yeah, it must have won. No inevitability about it. The story is actually very different. Okay. How do we define Europe's Middle Ages? Well, obviously, we've got the chronological ones. You know, the, uh, people can debate where, the, where, does the middle, where does the medieval era begin. People do this all the time. I think myself, I like to think of them as bookended by the arrival of uh, some game-changing technologies. So, to begin with, uh, okay, what's a technology? Well. In the broadest sense, the way you'd use it in um, the cost minimization problem that economists use, 
Um, a technology is any method for combining inputs to produce an output. That's valuable for modeling. It's sometimes unsatisfying in capturing the qualitative advert aspects. But I'm going to keep the definition reasonably broad because I want to be a little bit broader than just, just artifacts. So technology could be a means of organization as well. So for example, the three field system is a technology. My candidate is to say that the Middle Ages start with the arrival of the stirrup. Now, this is a, a little bit of a weird one, but okay, nobody's quite sure who invented the stirrup in the first place. Uh, best guesses are it's either India or China. Uh, it arrived in, the, uh, in Europe in the ninth century. And the stirrup has one very, very key feature. It keeps your feet in place when you're on the back of a horse. Before the stirrup, you could use cavalry in battle, pulling chariots, or um, as a place for archery, as the Mongols still continue to do, uh, riding without stirrups. However, if you're going to swing a sword or smash a lance into someone, you need something that keeps your feet anchored, otherwise you just fall off your horse. Um, it's with the arrival of the stirrup that uh, cavalry, and in particular the shock cavalry uh, that was used by Charles Martel, um, starts to spread through Europe. And with it, with it comes a need to breed horses. Okay, so now you've demonstrated the advantage of shock cavalry charges. You've got, uh, you've, you know, you, you've got horses that have to carry an armored man. They need to be bigger, right? Okay, breeding horses isn't cheap. So what do you do? Well, what Charles Martel did was he expropriated a lot of land from the church, gave it to his followers under a set of principles called chivalry from Cheval. And this is a method of organization that sweeps across Europe in the early Middle, in the early Middle Ages, largely uh, around the need to produce cavalry. So game-changing technologies, and this is an example of one, they aren't necessarily what you think they are. We all, we all have an idea, the steam engine, the aeroplane. Well, yeah, but go back far enough and they can be, you know, as, as seemingly trivial as the stirrup was, or they can be uh, much broader than we think. Um, as Schumpeter points out, innovations can come from almost any space. They can be organizational or business model based as much as they are items or processes. The key question for thinking about whether a technology is going to be game changing or not is therefore how many other systems does it uh, affect? Uh, what about the end? Well, I've got a couple of... Uh, couple of uh, candidates here. One is an answer to a question, which is, what happened to the knights in shining armor? Now, when I ask the class this, always everyone gives the first answer. That, uh, you know, it gives the same answer. You're all going to give the same answer as well if I ask you, aren't you? No? Nobody, everyone's too shy? Everyone's too shy to say gunpowder. Gunpowder. Everyone says gunpowder. Gunpowder. Well, look. Here's our knight on the left, and here's our armoured soldiers in the 21st century, right? The armour's changed from plate mail to Kevlar, but it's armour nonetheless. So uh, this, is, this is one part of it, the, the technological aspect of being a knight, if you will, as opposed to the organisational aspect. And also, cannons were used at the Battle of Crecy in 1346. They were called Rebaldakin. Uh, plate mail armor was proved against musket balls. Uh, funnily enough, the effect of a rebaldakin was much more uh, felt on the unarmored horses that were used by cavalry rather than the knights themselves. Okay, so candidate number one, a strategy, the pike square formation. The idea of this is to get among the horses and surround them 
um, and make, uh, make it so that the cavalry charge itself is no longer the fearsome weapon that it, that it appeared to be. Okay, I think this is a very good point. Um, I'm going to say it's a little laboured because uh, uh, the English at Agincourt also found another really good weapon against cavalry was just putting a hail of arrows into the air. And it didn't matter if you were accurate, a fair number of them were going to bring down horses. And if you brought down the horses, you pretty much brought down the knights. So um, that's one of them. Interestingly enough, um, the riding techniques changed around the time of the Pike Square. Um, as a defense against the Pike Square, have anyone seen the Olympic sport of dressage, where you uh, get a horse to move a sideways, backwards, forwards? This actually comes from battlefield training. It's, uh, it was originally a martial art. And it was uh, actually because pike squares meant that the form straight formation charges were no longer as effective. So maneuvering around the pike squares became more important. Um, the second one comes from this gentleman here, Luca Pacioli, who I think of as the first management consultant in history. He was a, an Italian monk who was charged with determining whether the Duke of Lombardy was being def defrauded. So what he did was he went around Venice and he uh, looked at the financial and accounting techniques of um, the uh, merchants, of which there were many in the city. And he returned with uh, a document called De Summa Arithmetica, where he recorded all of these, including the prototypical uh, financial work and also um, double entry bookkeeping, um, a system for making sure that your accounts were, and it, he uses a beautiful phrase here. He says, it is the will of God that your accounts should be in perfect and harmonious balance. In other words, your assets should equal your liabilities plus capital, etc. So, the importance of finance. The European Middle Ages were effectively on a gold standard. They were characterized by gluts and shortages of money. The gluts often coming after the population had fallen because of plague. Um, discussion points we would use on this then is to take this into a broader sphere of money as a technology and what the effect of tight money policies on innovation might be. And we'd also note that one of the effects of uh, cheap capital is to use it unwisely. And a feature that precedes most of the recent crashes, especially the dot-com and the great financial crisis, is cheap capital fueling a bubble. Okay, but you know, histories are a story written after the fact and there are attempts to make sense of the world that you know events that might have happened in all manner of other ways question which was invented first the fax machine or the telephone the fax machine 30 years before alexander graham bell patented the telephone there were fax services running between milan paris and geneva uh, the patent officers of them, uh, sending documents between them. Who invented techno? This is my favorite question. <laughs> no? Well, this is the Belleville tr Three. Juan Atkins, Derek May, and Kevin Saunderson from Detroit, 1980s. This is the conventional view. This is the real answer. These are the Banu Musa brothers from 9th century Baghdad. What they did was they made automated sequences out of entirely mechanical parts. So you can actually do this yourself. What you need is uh, the roll in the middle of some al uh, aluminum foil. And what you do is you put something, even pencils will do, you put those at equidistant points around the ring. Then as you turn the ring, you can have those strike an object. There you go, a proto-medieval drum machine. Doesn't sound exactly like an 808, but you know, if you wanted to make a hybrid one, you could, and uh, by the way, uh, if you wanted to make a hybrid one, Pat Metheny has actually done this, uh, the jazz guitarist Pat Metheny. Um, you, you have that so it strikes, hits the button 
on an 808 drum machine. So you turn the drum, you turn this wheel, that hits a button, there you go, a hybrid medieval stroke modern techno instrument. This one is often uh, extremely challenging because sadly, worldwide, um, the story of technology has focused primarily on the European industrial revolutions. And, well, one of the things is that many of these technologies were invented in other places, just never diffused. Uh, another example of this is uh, China having worked out how to make a smallpox vaccine at about the time that the British were living in mud huts. So, uh, you know, about the time of Alfred the Great. So, you know, this now becomes a, a question about why is it that obviously valuable technologies don't diffuse? Because human creativity is endless. We, we are always coming up with ideas. Ideas are, are cheap. But the implementation of those ideas, getting them to market, getting them embedded in the market, that's the hard part. So this is a view that uh, comes from Schumpeter and his followers, um, who I think is uh, really, you know, if we're going to be looking at any particular industrial economist, this is the one that I think whose works are very relevant now. Um, and the important thing is the development of technology in the Schumpeterian view is not teleological. There's no end state. People don't know where it's going, although they may have some great visions for it, they don't know for certain. It involves randomness, it involves dead ends, it involves sudden reversals of course and going back and forward over things. And the one thing that really unites all of this is this process of grasping um, uh, for, for the correct uh, market implementation of your idea. Okay, the second one was the theory of strategy. So um, just quickly take a time check. Good. Um, now, game theory is where we, you usually start. And it's the one piece of economic syllabus that's reasonably well represented in popular culture. I mean, I, I could write a book on all of the things about economics that pop culture and movies and TV gets completely wrong. My favorite one being um, GoldenEye, uh, the James Bond film, where the villain intends to use a satellite weapon that's going to destroy the Bank of England and all of the records in the financial system so he can walk in and steal all of the money that is now worth a precise value of nothing. <laughs> so um, economics doesn't get very well represented. Uh, I can probably point to basically Moneyball and The Big Short as being the, the only two uh, films that really center on it. Um, but game theory is, uh, if you look at Dr. Strangelove, um, Kubrick's classic, The Godfather, obviously a beautiful mind which uh, follows its one of its inventors, John Nash, uh, the other great inventor of it, Herb uh, von Neumann, was, uh, is the uh, scientist with the Nazi right arm in Dr. Strangelove. And uh, The Princess Bride, where you'll find uh, a backward induction being used to absurd uh, levels in the scene between uh, Vizzini the Sicilian and um, the Dread Pirate Roberts. Okay, checkpoint. Level of students. Game of Thrones is actually better for doing more advanced problems. If you're just giving people the intro to it, use the wire instead. Because the first model you tend to start with is the prisoner's dilemma. And basically the wire runs the prisoner's dilemma through uh, every single season. Every single one has at least some issue to do with forming a cartel, breaking a cartel, why it is people rat each other out, what organized crime tries to do in, in order to get to a more win-win solution for its own members. Um, game theory can always be used more cooperatively as well as, uh, as, as for example, Eleanor Ostrom did. Um, 
It's really important, I find, when I'm teaching game theory to say that the prisoner's dilemma is only the most famous model, but there are other ones, like the stag hunts, that are actually about cooperation and coordination problems rather than uh, you know, straight up lose-lose situations. Um, we tend to start with the uh, notorious photocopier scene from The Wire, which uh, I'd like to play to you. Has ever, anyone seen this one? Okay. This is the high point of The Wire Season 5, which, and the disappointment Wire fans have with The Wire Season 5 is far greater than any Game of Thrones season after Season 5. But, uh, because it comes after the absolutely perfect Season 4. But this scene is the absolute high point. Um, do I need to explain the prisoner's dilemma? Uh, 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 no, I, I don't, do I, does anybody want me to run through this quickly? No? Okay. Okay, so here's a prisoner's dilemma being played. You see now, I'm here to tell you, this remaining silent shit ain't nothing like they make it out to be. Mm. You up in here all tight with it, waiting for your pay lawyer, thinking you all wise, ain't you? No, see, that work when you some kind of criminal mastermind, when you ain't been seen running from the deed, when your own fucking running partner ain't in the next room putting you in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's telling it like a little bitch. We even went to Mickey D's for him because he was so motherfucking helpful. Two quarter pounders, big fries, McDonald land cookies, Dr. Pepper. That's how your boy rolled, right? All right, step out. Where are we going? Break room. So you can enjoy that, huh? All right, I still ain't saying shit to y'all. Yeah. Why not? What the fuck? How many years you figure we've been doing this same shit? Twenty at least. Yeah. True. True. False. Load them up. So this shit actually works, huh? Hell yeah. Americans are stupid people by and large. We pretty much believe whatever we're told. Right. So I can feel my heartbeat? Pops, yeah. If Marno said I had the gun, he lying. The machine tells the tale, son. We ready, Professor? Yeah. We'll start with an easy one. Is your name, in fact, Deshaun Fredericks. Yeah. True. And do you reside, in fact, the 1200 block of Woodyear Street in West Baltimore? Yeah. True. And did you and Monel shoot your boy Pookie down on Cary Street just like Monel said you did? No, nah, no. Lie. Lying motherfucker. Mm. Mm -hmm. Machine is never wrong, son. Fuck, man. Nigga can't never keep his damn mouth shut. I should have busted a cap and Pookie ass my own self. Left Marnell home and shit. He just a bitch is all. The bigger the lie, the more they believe. So uh, that is how you play a prisoner's dilemma. Um, 
And allegedly, uh, you, you, you may or may not know this, but David Simon, uh, one of the writers, was a crime reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and the other writer, Ed Burns, was a detective. And this was something that the Baltimore police really did. So this is how we introduce the prisoner's dilemma. Now, um, little question, little side question. Um, you get this sequential equilibrium of uh, people trying to get the crown and uh, uh, either failing or succeeding and therefore failing in uh, Game of Thrones. Um, in its relevance to the modern day, can anybody tell me which post-World War II British Prime Ministers have taken office as a result of an election win? No conferring? No? Okay. The answers are, oops, the answer is Attlee, Churchill, Wilson, Thatcher, Blair, and Cameron. All of the others succeeded by stabbing their rivals. So, for example, um, Major uh, was the person who finally succeeded after the contest to remove Thatcher. Um, Brown uh, did it by uh, forcing Blair out. Um, May did it as the result of Cameron being forced to resign. So surprisingly often, Britain shows an equilibrium of sequential internal party coups. Okay, does this explain Brexit at all to you? <laughs> And what's been going on since Brexit at all. Um, and we have an organizational behavior theory that we can actually use to um, align with this. So this is, you know, why are CEOs worth so much? Answer, because they're the winner of a tournament where, to quote Highlander, there can be only one. And um, as a result, they will have achieved their position by having sequentially won all of these steps up the ladder, and therefore they're worth it. Um, so the question I would then throw back at the students is, well, when's the best time, or how do you spot how to make your move? And one that's very relevant, this was how both May and Major got the prime ministership in Britain as well, is something called the Truel. So we have three bandidos here. We have good who hits his target 90% of the time. We have Bad, who hits his target 70% of the time. And we have Ugly, who hits his target only 10% of the time. Each has one bullet. Ugly shoots first, what should he do? No, because if you shoot at the 90% guy, you've got only got a 10% chance of hitting, right? Yeah? And secondly, if you actually hit him, then what's the 70% guy going to do? The answer is, yeah, exactly. Well, actually, the more correct answer is it doesn't matter what he does as long as the bullet doesn't go anywhere near the other two. So because that way, the, the next one to shoot is going to have to concentrate on the best person, aren't they? So basically, you take yourself out of the game. Yeah? Um, and this is also part of an insight that you'll see both in uh, The Wire and Game of Thrones. You know, in the Game of Thrones, we've got the you win or you die. In The Wire, you've got um, the only way to win is not to play. And you come at the king, you best not miss. Okay, so just a few of the advanced question. Uh, repeated games, I've got Tywin's famous quote here. Um, if you repeat a game infinitely, there are, usually we contrast three strategies. Um, if you forgive the first transgression, punish the second, but return to cooperation when the punished returns to cooperation, that's called firm but fair. If you punish transgression but return to cooperation when the punished returns to cooperation, that's called tit for tat, and that's Tywin's recommendation. And the third one is uh, the grim trigger. You punish and you keep punishing. You never forgive. Um, so this is basically vendetta. And Tywin's insight is that two dominates three, and in that he's correct, but actually forgiving the first transgression dominates 
um, punishing it. Okay, so general advice, wire is better for beginners, advanced students, Game of Thrones gets you into repeated games, questions of strategy uh, in, in uh, non-cooperative strategy very, very much quicker. Um, the really big thing is you've got to define domain and participants really carefully. So uh, we've had uh, some talk that mentioned Sun Tzu, for example, and you know a lot of managers have Sun Tzu for managers on their, on their bookshelf. Um, you know, the number of people out there who go, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a master strategist, I read The Art of War, you know. Uh, okay, Sun Tzu says if you want your troops to fight harder, you should burn their ships so that they've got no means of retreat. If you go all in as a corporation and people think you're doing something insane, they start sending their CVs out. The two situations are not comparable. The two domains are not comparable and you've got to adapt your reasoning accordingly. So that's the kind of health warning that goes on there. Um, and very quickly, I'll just flip through a few quick ways we've found to use GOT. Um, marriage. We've considered marriage as if it were a merger or the formation of a cartel. Um, and with the grim note that mergers almost always end up underperforming the market. You know, other ways you can see to buck this stylized fact. Is it just the contract? Should you be thinking more generally about maximizing uh, collective welfare? Um, and marriage as an economic phenomenon is explored in the works of Gary Becker. And obviously a lot of cultures in the world treat marriage as being less a romantic phenomenon and more an economic arrangement. So this one actually works very, what I'll say, ecumenically across a lot of cultures who don't necessarily see things in the romantic way we tend to. Uh, public choice. Consider the heads of houses in Game of Thrones as rational actors. So um, how do you behave? What are, this, what are the incentives on you? How do you uh, think about this? And we find how, found very useful was to adopt uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, great observation that all power is acting in concert, even Caligula needed someone to guard him when he slept. Um, so if you wanted to get to the Iron Throne, what alliances should you have cultivated? Would you cultivate? How could you do it? Okay, and this is a, a, you know, a very constant theme in Game of Thrones, the importance of alliance. And one of my favorite ones is think, uh, so we produce a lot of very clever students who are, are quite driven and want to change the world and don't often think about what the external cost of their actions is. The things that, uh, the things that fall on a third party who's not uh, necessarily involved as the target of your policy. And we introduce this one with um, Jorah Mormont's quote. Um, it's no matter to the small folk if the High Lords play their Game of Thrones so long as they're left in peace. They never are. Okay, uh, I won't go on to this bit because we've got a panel, I think, tomorrow that's doing the industrial organization of media. But if you wanted to ask me any questions about it, this is actually a little bit more my specific subject, so I'm very happy to do it. So th thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience, and um, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, brilliant speaking. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, one more about Game of Thrones and one more uh, uh, technical about uh, economics and economic history. Uh, 
The question about economic history is, um, uh, why, why do you think, uh, uh, no, what, what, sorry, what do you think about the institutional, neo-institutional or institutional approach of uh, Asemoglu and Robinson about technology in uh, the book, uh, Why Nations mm -hmm. Fail? And uh, the other question on Game of Thrones is, uh, uh, do you think uh, that dragons can be considered a technology in the Game of Thrones world, and how they change the game? Okay, two really great questions. I'll, I'll deal with the second one first. Uh, watching the last episode, uh, the uh, thought that came into my mind was that the uh, dragon was the Lancaster bomber with uh, incendiary... Uh, uh, so... It's not a technology, per se, because it's a feature of the natural world, so it's a resource, really. However, it stands for a technology, if you like. Um, and uh, there is a very interesting uh, term that's used in futurology, which is called the outside context problem. Um, and dragons are an outside context problem. It comes from Ian M. Banks, and he, um, he says that uh, an outside context problem is something that a civilization encounters in the same way as a sentence encounters a full stop. Um, so imagine that you're there with uh, you know, uh, medieval um, technology. Uh, you're standing on the walls of the Tower of London, and you're preparing to repulse a siege, and overhead a Lancaster bomber comes along dropping incendiary weapons. That's the uh, type of thing that a dragon is. It's an OCP, outside context problem. Uh, on your first question, the Asimolu, uh, the Asimolu um, uh, point about institutions, I think that's one of the most important points that, that uh, economists have recently made. Uh, on a developmental level, this is one of the... Uh, really interesting questions about what it is about why some people seem to win out and some people seem to lose out. I don't think it explains everything. I think, for example, if we go back over the very long view, I found uh, most elites to be as extractive as each other over most of the historical period. It's just been a question of one group of elites were able to mobilize a force that turned up that destroy the society of the other group of elites. In the modern period, I think it explains a lot, but it doesn't explain everything, because even a society with an extractive elite can have a redistributive uh, you know, mechanism that goes along with it. So for that, think about, um, uh, ooh, I, I would say, you know, something like uh, Pablo Escobar's redistribution of some of the wealth that he just couldn't spend fast enough around Medellin. Okay, he was causing damage, but he was also founding institutions that, you know, served poorer areas. So um, there's a kind of a yin and yang about it, if you like. So I think that you can overstate the point, but I think it's a really important one and one that we really ought to look into very carefully. Uh, hello, I, I was considering while you were talking about the concept of true that maybe that could be explained with the figure of Littlefinger. Like Littlefinger being the ugly one in the true, uh, like the 10% one who is playing the other two to, to kill each other. Like, uh, this is show Littlefinger, not book Littlefinger. I was actually considering Book Littlefinger like this kind of guy who... Yeah, oh, sorry, that's the, that's the order I meant. Um, yeah, I think, I think to some extent that's what Littlefinger is doing. He knows he doesn't have an army. He knows he doesn't have a power base. So what he's trying to do is sow dissension amongst the other people so that they fight each other so that he's got an easier path to power. There's... Uh, 
some, a, a term that I believe is attributed to von Clausewitz in this as well, which is the strategy of tension, where what, if you want to take over a state, what you do is um, you basically sow that kind of dissension so that rather than having to conquer the place, you come in as the people who are going to sort out the mess so that you, um, you, know, you are welcomed as their new overlord. Um, and this, this is a variation of uh, the tool for the situation where you're actually able to manipulate the actions of others. Um, in game theory, you'd have to do that through signaling. So you would have to set up a set of signals that say, you shoot him, you shoot him. And, and because in game theory we have the double rationality principle, we have to do that by manipulating the payoffs alone. So, uh, yes, there is an anal analogue, and it is, if you like, an extension of the true. There's one thing that I think game theory doesn't cover, which is actually not, uh, not so much a, uh, a Game, of Thrones thing, Game of Thrones thing, but a Gotham City thing. What about people like the Joker? Uh, the Joker doesn't actually want to take over. The Joker's payoff comes from purely the dissension. So the, this one is another thing where um, I think we're not actually covering it and I think our understanding isn't working as well as it should. But there are characters like Littlefinger or the Joker in literature that should give us a few pointers towards it. Yeah, come, you got follow up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because I was thinking like, it actually doesn't make any sense for Littlefinger to win the game here. Like, in the series, he says like, something like, I want to sit in the throne. But for, right. for the character, does it, it, that doesn't make any sense. Like, he wants to create an economical situation that is favorable to, to him, not to rule. Actually, in the books, I think, I mean, uh, God, if I rem it's been a little bit of, uh, of a time since I've read A Feast for Crows, but his intention was actually to put Sansa on the throne as his, pop as his puppet. So... Um, I tell you what, this strategy of tension thing that he's uh, operating, Brexit referendum, why was Russia so interested in um, supporting Farage? Answer, to cause chaos. Not to, not to you know, um, particularly win, but to weaken our democracies. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. Talk about that comparisons. Um, could we? Re um, that made me to remember that um, Machal's plot, trying to get Mesela's in the throne, uh, could Machal's um, not a little house, but a house without uh, that great army that's. It was um, re reduced in the Robbers Rebellion. Uh, they're not a little house at all, but uh, they have not the power that Lannisters or other houses have. So they're trying to get uh, power by, by a little girl that has claimed to the throne. So that could be another example, like just like little finger, but in other ways. So sorry, can you rephrase the question again? I didn't quite get it as a question. It was, uh, which house was it you were... Martel, do you know what? I really haven't a clue how the Martel plot is really going. I, I mean, I know Doran's revealed all of his ideas and, uh, and what he thinks he's doing, but um, I think Doran is such a subtle strategist that even if you put it on the, on, on, on the page, you don't really quite know what he's planning overall. Um, and it also seems to me to be quite doomed to failure. Um, one of the key points is that the, the, the Game of Thrones is won by having allies. Um, Martel, unless, you know, what, once, uh, once Drogon's um, incinerated, uh, who was it who went out? Quentin, Mar Quint Quentin Martel? Yeah, once Drogon's incinerated the prince there, you know, it's pretty clear that he doesn't really have those kind of allies. 
So now you've got, in the newest stuff, you've got Ariane meeting with the Golden Company. I think the Golden Company are doomed to fail as well because the other side has a weapon of mass destruction. Um, and that's the only way that they can uh, win without necessarily having the troop strength of the other, other sides. Oh, and by the way, on troop strength here, so Daenerys has 100,000 uh, Dothraki screamers, right? Okay, suppose we take the comparable of uh, Genghis Khan's uh, Golden Horde. So uh, four horses to each rider. Okay, so we've got 400,000 horses, plus equipment, feed for the horses, etc., etc. And she's got to transport those across boats across, across the sea. How many... Game of Thrones boats do you think it would take to transport 100,000 men, 400,000 horses, and feed across the sea? Yeah, I know, the mind's starting to boggle on this one, isn't it? I'm just kind of like, how logistically can that work? And a uh, little military mo moral of the story that I think is really important and everybody should know is uh, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. Uh, sorry if I've not fully answered your question and taken it off somewhere, but I, I, you, know, you, you kind of put the thought in my head there. I've got just a quick one. Uh, how is the reaction and the experience of your students by using uh, The Wire and Game of Thrones as teaching? Oh, great. Yeah, uh, so when we took on the course in, 20, we took on the course in 2010, um, and we kind of revamped the philosophy then, uh, we went up, we get rated one to five on all of our evaluations. Um, we found that when we started using The Wire in 2010, we went up from um, three and a bit to uh, nearly fives on everything. So it, it worked really, really well. Um, the problem we've had with the wire is actually a, a surprise, well, maybe surprising one, but um, uh, we have a lot of students from the Far East and from places where English isn't the first language. And um, Baltimore English is particularly difficult. Um, so they, they did at first, you know, say, but then I had to say, well, you could watch it subtitled. <laughs> that, that, was, um, that was the solution on this one. Um, Game of Thrones, it's brilliant because it's a pop culture phenomenon. So I just have to go, so anyone been watching Game of Thrones then? You know, I, I, and I'll, I'll introduce one of these points. And usually you'll get, firstly, you'll get a laugh. And then secondly, when you go back to the economic theory, people are actually enthused about it. So we have our lecture on a Tuesday and our seminars on a Thursday. On Tuesday, we introduce the theory with a bit of Game of Thrones or The Wire or, or, or one of the other properties we use. Um, we try to choose something that's good for it. And then on the Thursday, we usually find people excited to start talking. And actually, uh, in The Prisoner's Dilemma, to tell me that I'm wrong, the, the, the people will not rat each other out. Um, so usually what I do to do that is I actually then play a prisoner's dilemma with them without telling them, and they rat each other out, <laughs> almost inevitably. Yeah, okay. Um, if somebody goes first strike with a nuke, what do you do? I mean, do you retaliate? Is there a point in it? That's the huge transgression kind of thing. That's about as huge as you can go with it. Uh, and really, you just go, they've got nukes in the air, we just retaliate and just burn it all. Um, 
and actually you hope that they don't because you hope that the fact that you're going to burn it all is the deterrent. Um, yes and no. Um, it, it does depend on the payoffs, but usually how you construct a prisoner's dilemma, you don't have that kind of strategy because that effectively ends the game. So usually, you know, saying, yeah, it's all right, lads, you know, is not a bad strategy to begin with. Um, and I'll tell you where we, got it, we, where we got it wrong and where we got it very right. Where we got it wrong was the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah? So there, we punished Germany and eventually impoverished them to the extent that they got this Hitler chap in who turned out to be quite a beastly fellow. Place where we got it really right was Japan. I mean, we'd had no history of war with Japan before World War II, right? So it's a first transgression. After the war, we raised them up again. Uh, under General MacArthur, a group of American engineers went to Japan bringing the work of a British physicist called Edward Deming to them as a, as a manual. And that became the famous Toyota operating manual that then became the philosophy of Kaizen that underpinned all of the Japanese industrial system. And what we realized was, yes, they had been the aggressor in the war. Yes, we'd had to defend ourselves. And yes, we'd gone to some you know, pretty terrible resorts to do so. But afterwards, we had to raise them back up again. Because if we just kept punishing them, what were we going to do? What was going to happen? They'd just keep on coming back. So you, really, a, a good way of doing this is that you know, if you're going to meet an, a, a, an opponent again, it's not really a great payoff to humiliating them. That's the lesson I'd really take away from it. That's what they decided also with Germany after the Second Absolutely, World War. Yeah. There was that, that uh, the Morgenthau um, proposal was to just make it an agricultural land and destroy the industry, and they decided against it. Absolutely. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it was probably the sanest piece of policy that anybody has ever, ever come up with to, to break that kind of wheel of punishment. And, and it shows it works. Punishment is not always the best strategy. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, Peter Antonian. Thank you very much indeed and for having me.